Right, God bless you folks. We're live here at Lake Point Baptist Church. Hope you're all having a wonderful day. Uh, the Lord be with you and bless you. In Jesus' name, amen. Can I always be with the dentist? I can't be with the dentist. I Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Lake Point Baptist Church. Like a tree planted by the water, we never will. Christ, because of salvation by grace through the name of Jesus Christ, and that only. Lord, thank you so much this day you've allowed us to be here to freely worship before you. May we do that in spirit and in truth, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. amen. Please have a seat. We missed something as we started today, and as the brother pastor's coming up, I have one huge list here given by Brother Dave and by Deb here. This huge list has the names of people who've had anniversaries or birthdays. There's a lot of them. I think the Ariana family's got a really corner on it this, this month. So we're going to sing happy birthday in just a moment, but we're going to do it to Trish Wilson. She's in back there. Lupita, I don't know if they're here or not. Um, uh, Ariano and Randy McNally, I know he's there. And Catherine Rash, she's here. Drew, he's probably off at school still, right? He's not here? Okay. Uh, Armando Ariano, uh, Huey Campbell, I don't see the Campbells here. Uh, let's see. Bill and Trish Wilson got an anniversary this month, right? Hey, all right. How many years? Forty-five. Forty-five. Woo! Dude, you got us beat. All right. Woohoo! Let's see. And the Brooks. Brooks got an anniversary. I know you don't have us beat. So, uh, Tom and Emmy, how many years? Forty-nine. Forty-nine. Woohoo! Yeah, the, the stakes are going higher here. 
And Pedro and Krista, Ariana, I don't think they're here, so but, uh, let's uh, A, sing happy birthday, everybody. Ready? Happy birthday. Hey, it, let me let me do this for a second. Y'all hear anything missing? You yeah, no, no, no noise. No yeah. noise. Yeah. <laughs> Woo! Pastor fixed that problem this week. Yay! Yeah, yeah. <laughs> All I had to do was throw out the old one and get a new one. Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes that's how that works. All right, let's take a look at uh, announcements this week. Take out your bulletins. Uh, look at the. In fact, look at the. Just start with the very back of the dates to remember. Uh, I made a statement uh, earlier this or last week, and, and I, I directed it toward the men. But uh, ladies, you are also welcome to cook a pot of chili if you think you can outdo one of us. You hearing me? Um, on the November the seventh, we're going to have an outreach fundraiser. We're going to do all we can to raise money to to get stuff together to do outreach better. Um, and so, because, you know, we're a small church, we're a poor church, we need to raise money. And quite frankly, y'all need to open up your wallets a little bit more. Uh, take a look at the back. Notice that it's coming November the 7th. If you, there's a sign-up sheet out on the coffee bar to sign up to bring, like, bring stuff, like cornbread, onions, cheese, sour cream, whatnot. But there's also a place to sign up to cook a pot of chili, $5 entry fee, uh, I guess we're going to have to figure out who's going to be the judge. Can't be anybody with bad taste. Somebody who has no taste in their mouth. So uh, do sign up for that and help raise funds for our outreach program. All right, that's that announcement. Also, oh, look underneath that. This is a big one. This is a huge one. We've been waiting a long time. And thank you, Heather, so much for contacting people because well, I'm busy. I don't have time. Somebody else got to do stuff. But Heather... <laughs> has stepped in there and she got a hold of Holiday Inn Express over in Catawba, right there behind the other McDonald's here in town. Uh, we're gonna meet there at two o'clock on the 17th. For those of you that need to be baptized, you know who you are, Jeremy, Marissa, and you two in the back, we need to have a conversation. Yay. I might drag you up here, I don't know, because I think I heard something pretty cool, didn't I? I did. I did. Here's something really cool. And I'm going to, you know what, I'm just going to go ahead and do it because angels in heaven rejoice over one sinner that repents. And Angel, I want you to stand up right now and everybody give her just a loving big hand because she has accepted Christ as her Savior. And, and uh, that's just awesome news. And we're going to get her baptized, Marissa baptized. Jeremy, you need to be baptized probably more than once. Aubrey, Aubrey, you need to be baptized. Amen. So on November 17th, 2 o'clock after church, we're doing baptism some, uh, Sunday right down there at that, that uh, uh, Holiday Inn Express. And I can't talk enough about that. That's super exciting. All right. Huh? Yo, get in the pool. Lori, you need to show up. Because if you don't, I'll come to your house with a bucket of water. Um, I mean, all I got to do is get your head in it. I just need a five-gallon bucket. Um, <laughs> All right, look on the inside, and you'll see uh, notes for this week. So if anybody's watching online, and hopefully the video is not fading in and out, I think I fixed that. If you're watching online and, and you watch regularly, and if the Holy Spirit still leaves you, you can donate at our website, lakepointbaptist.org. There's a button you can click. If you have not given Dave and Deb your information, his cell phone number is on here, so that you can give him birthday and anniversary information, so we can celebrate like we do today. We need more nursery volunteers. And there's a prayer list somewhere. Raleigh took them all home with him, prayed them over, and then he brought them back. So I think they're back there in the back if you want to grab a prayer list on the way out. And I think that's all of the announcements for that. Uh, please take a look at last week's giving and make a note of that in your heart, please. All right, uh, one other announcement that's not on here that I need to go ahead and mention. If you look out on the coffee bar, there's these little Chinese food packages. Those are called, that's coins for kids, and that's for Brother Kyle who does Children's Evangelism Fellowship, who does Good News Club, which brings youngsters to Christ, and, and sometimes it brings people in the church, amen? amen. So uh, he's, they, get, they get a little old during the wintertime or this time of year, so they, they do this, and, and, and we need to have those back next Sunday. I guess all that babbling to tell you, if you have one of those, 
whatever change you have in it, bring it back next Sunday, and I will call him, go meet him, and give him all that change uh, so that they can continue to do their ministry. Uh, amen. Am I missing any announcements? Yes, dear. Did you want to mention the change on Wednesday night? Oh, well, yeah, Wednesday night, and it's not a big deal, but Wednesday night we still have Bible study, but there's going to be a, a structural change. It's actually going to start at 7. I know we've always started at 6.30, but we don't, do we? If, if we actually start at 6.30, raise your hand. Nobody's got their hand up, do they? No. We have fellowship and things happen. We chit-chat and we talk. And we really don't get started till 7. So here's the thing. We're going to start at 7, but I'm going to ask that you show up at 6.30 or a quarter till so that you can fellowship, okay? And then at 7 o'clock, we come in here and we're going to take the prayer list and split it up, Okay? And there's going to be several groups. Each group takes a part of the prayer list, goes to a different area, prays, prays whatever that is, takes about 20 minutes, and then we come back at 7.20 and do Bible study. Amen? Amen. Thank you very much. And also take a note also on, uh, in case some of you don't know, that we've moved youth uh, from Thursday night to Tuesday night. And it's not just youth anymore. It's youth discipleship. We started last week. It went really well. I believe you guys learned something. Uh, and if you didn't, well, we'll keep teaching you until you do. <laughs> All right. Any other? Am I missing? Heather, am I missing anything? Okay, good. Well, uh, let's do that thing where we get up and go around and greet one another. Thank Pick another seat. There's a joke in there. Anyway, uh, open up your Bibles for the scripture reading this morning. A very relevant passage today. It's actually going to go right along with our message. Open up your, your Bibles to the book of the Psalms or Psalms, as I like to call them, and go to the 51st Psalm, please. Psalm number 51. I think it's missing. Nope, there it is. This is a psalm written by David. Hear the word of God. It says, Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according unto the multitude of thy tender mercies. Blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from mine iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. 
For I acknowledge my transgressions, and my sin is ever before me. Against thee, thee only, have I sinned, and done this evil in thy sight, that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest, and be clear when thou judgest. Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, thou desirest truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden part thou shalt make me to know wisdom. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me to hear joy and gladness, that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. Hide thy face from my sins, and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore me into the joy of thy salvation, and uphold me with thy free spirit. Then will I teach transgressors thy ways, and sinners shall be converted unto thee. Deliver me from blood guiltness, O God, thou God of my salvation, and my tongue shall sing aloud of thy righteousness. O Lord, open thou my lips, and my mouth shall show forth thy praise. For thou desirest not sacrifice, else I would give it. Thou delightest not in burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. O God, thou wilt not despise. Amen. Do good in thy good pleasure unto Zion. Build thou the walls of Jerusalem. Then thou shalt be pleased with the sacrifices of righteousness, with burnt offering and whole burnt offering. Then shall they offer bullets upon thine altar. Amen. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we love you. We thank you, God, for the salvation that comes through the shed blood of Jesus Christ because there's no other way for us to come before you today. Father, we thank you for washing all that away from us so that we can have right relationship with you. Father, we just we lift up today to you. We lift up our hearts to you. We say, God, pray. Please, God, we pray, prepare our hearts to receive your word, to receive your message, to praise you. Father God, we love you and we thank you for this day. We pray that everything we do glorify you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, if you're standing, please keep standing. If you can, stand up. We just can't be silent. we got such a great Lord. We talk about being redeemed. That is the Lord paying the ransom price for our sin. That's what we're talking about. That's what Fanny Crosby wrote about. Let's sing her song. Redeemed how my love to proclaim. Redeemed. 
Redeemer 
Brother Ned. Let's see. Who do I want to pick on today? Brother Dave, would you stand up and pray for the message and for, the, for what we're about to do here, please? Yes, sir. <coughs> Our dear gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we just want to thank you for this wonderful day that you've provided for us, Lord. Thank you for each one here, Lord. Thank you for our safety and traveling mercy as we came in. Now, Lord, we thank you for the blessing of the music and, and our music group that sing the, uh, leads us in this singing, Lord. We just want to thank you for that and praise you for that, Lord. And now, Lord, I pray for my pastor, Lord, as he gives out the message today. I ask you to anoint him with your Holy Spirit power, Lord. Use him in a mighty way. Give him, I know you've given him a great message. Now I pray that you'll help him to give it out in such a way that each one of us, Lord, will be drawn closer to you, Lord, and closer to each other as the family of God. And we'll just thank and praise you for this and for everything. For in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Brother Dave. All right, it is good to see each and every one of you here this morning. Um, and I'm really thrilled to have Dan and Anita here today. Um, and, and so I hope you guys ain't too hungry. I'm going to try to cut my part short, but I told Dan he could have an hour. So um, I want to go ahead and get right to work this morning. And you know me. You know that if you counseled with me, you know that I don't beat around the bush, do I? I don't, I don't pull no punches. I go right to the, to the heart of the matter and try to get to it and then go to answer that question, whatever you might have or whatever problem you might have with Scripture. And one of those pieces of scripture, I don't have it on the board this morning, don't go there, I just remembered it um, a little earlier today, but there's a, there's a passage of scripture that I use pretty regularly to counsel people in, in all kinds of areas of life, okay? Because a lot of times when I'm counseling people, the problem they really have is not with themselves, but with somebody else, Amen. I didn't think so. You always have a problem with somebody else. That's usually where it comes from. And I, my answer to that is to always come back, and it's in Philippians 2.12. If you want to highlight it, you probably should. <laughs> Philippians 2.12 says, Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Now, that doesn't mean go to the gym and, uh, and work on your body. It doesn't mean earn your salvation. It means work on, practice. Practice your faith in God. Your faith, not somebody else's faith. Your faith in God. You need to practice that. I don't have time to fix you people. Okay? I don't have time to fix anybody I'm mad at. I don't have time to fix anybody that's offended me. All i got time to do is work on me and be obedient to God. Okay? So work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. And as I thought about that passage, because for the past few weeks I have been studying on something really bizarre... You wouldn't think so, but I've been studying and looking at and researching my own personal relationship with God. Not anybody else's, not any great theologian, not any apostle. I've been studying my own personal relationship with God because, well, I am a pastor, I'm a preacher, I'm a counselor, I'm a teacher. I do these things. I read the Bible. I went to college. I did all this stuff, and I, and I pray, and I study, but that's the, that's the technical stuff i got to think about my personal relationship with God. You see, some people are under a very bizarre impression, and I'm going to try to clear that up this morning, that a pastor or a preacher, a holy man, has a red-hot bat phone to God. Some of you that are older know what I'm talking about. In Bruce Wayne's office, there is a red phone. And when he picks that thing up and pushes that button, man, it, man, it goes straight to the commissioner. Or the commissioner has one of his own. It's under a cake lid. That's hilarious. He pulls off that black kit and pushes that button. Batman's on the other line. And some people think that pastors have that with God, that we have this hotline to God. So they, they come to us and they ask us for special prayer. And the thing, what I need you to understand is, is that um, you, as a Christian, have that same connection. You all have that hotline to God, that salvation, that is Jesus Christ, the mediator that sits between us and the Father and makes intercession. And, and I need you to know that. Uh, the reason that you think we do it is you think that we're, that we're closer to God and maybe we got some kind of extra pull or some kind of extra influence. And as far as I know, as far as I've studied, we don't. 
We don't have that extra pull. Every Christian has the same connection to God as all others, and that is Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. And it's not that you shouldn't come to us. I'm not going to tell you don't come to me with your prayer request. Please do. Please come to me with your prayer request. Come to someone with your prayer request because we should all be praying more. We should all be praying together more. James 5.16 tells us this. It says, confess your faults. Hear that? Confess your faults. Not his faults, but your faults. One to another and pray one for another that you may be healed. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. God wants us as individuals and as a church family and as children of God. He wants to hear from us. But on that personal level, I got to thinking, how much closer to God did I really need to be and really want to be? Let me say that again. How much closer to God I really need to be? Need to be. As I've mentioned for the past couple of weeks, I have been on a social media fast. I get on there long enough to upload our service so that somebody can watch that's not here and to send out a message and then I'm off. I don't sit there and scroll through it. And, and what has happened is I've replaced that time when I think that I'm bored enough to do that. I sit down and I either pray or I open my Bible and I read it and I pray over that passage. Amen. And it has been wonderful. It has been so beneficial to my spiritual health. I told you, too, that I, I got a little bored, so I thought, oh, I'll just play a little solitaire. I got a solitaire game on my phone, and I started doing that instead of scrolling through social media. And it has this little statistic thing on there, and when I punched on statistics to find out how many games I was winning or losing, it told me that the first week I had the game that I was on there for 10 hours. Just on and off. You know, you do that watching television. It's not like I was 10 hours straight, but those 10 hours could have been spent with him. And it broke my heart. It made me a little bit sad that instead of focusing on God and spending my time with him, I was with my face in a machine. That made me think about the type of relationship that we have. We want to spend more time with God. i got to tell you, just coming to church and praying in church and coming to Bible study, it's not enough. That's right. It's not enough. I, I heard a preacher this week says, you may think you know God because you read the Bible. You know of God, but you don't know Him unless you spend time with Him. So i got to think about what type of relationship do I want with God? Do I really need with God? And I have a couple of biblical examples. Number one, uh, is the example of Moses. I'm getting there. I just need, I've got a staff now. I'm going to go out and try to part Lake Erie. <laughs> but, but I want a relationship that Moses had with God. It says in the Bible that Moses was a friend of God. So many of us fear God, and we need to, by the way. There are times you need to fear God, and you know what I'm talking about. You have to have reverence of God. You have to be in awe of God, but I really want to be a friend of God. The Bible tells us that Moses was a friend of God. Exodus 33, 11, And the Lord spake unto Moses face to face as a man speaks to his friend. And then I thought of another example. And I didn't know if I wanted to be one or the other or added them both together, but it's David. Amen. David was a man after God's own heart. <laughs> A man after God's own heart. I want to be a man after God's own heart. Face to face, a friend of God. Acts 13 and 22 is where that's found. And Paul quoted some Old Testament scripture and mixed it up and put it together. He says, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart. And listen to this, which shall fulfill all my will. That's what I want. That's the relationship I want with God. I want to be so obedient. The God that I'm a friend of His and that I will I am after His heart and that I want to fulfill all His will. Now, you're saying, well, you picked up David. David had some problems. Yeah, he did. 
But David, when he had a problem, did exactly what we should do. When he had a problem, he went to God. When I have a problem, I need to go to God. I need to tell him, and we need to tell him how much we need him. How much without him we're lost and aimless. When David realized the horror of his sin. Now David had quite a few sins. I don't, I don't have time to go through them, but David had a particularly horrible sin. And all sin is the same in the eyes of God, but some has worse consequences than others. Amen? Amen. David had a particularly horrible sin. He had committed adultery and tried to cover it up by murdering his friend. And when he realized how wrong that was, when it was brought to his attention, he prayed these words. It was from our scripture reading this morning. Psalm 51, 9 through 11. Let's go through that again. Hide thy face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God. And renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence. And take not thy Holy Spirit from me. David was so broken about what he had done in his act of sin against God. Against the Lord. He wasn't asking for his broken heart to be fixed. What he was saying there was, give me a new one. That word create, I can't pronounce it. There's no pronunciation for it. It's a, it's a Hebrew word. It's a B with a hyphen and an R and an A. It's a can't really say it. If Dr. Jeff was here, I'm sure he could say it. But that it's the same word that is used in the, in the, in the Genesis. Create in me a clean heart. God created the heavens and the earth. That word create means to create something new, something from nothing. It's the same word. In other words, what David was asking for was, give me a brand new heart. Take the, the old, broken, dark, messed up, gross, slimy heart, get it out of me, and give me one made by God. That was David's request in Psalm 51. So here's what I'm trying to get to. I want to be that close to God. I want to have that hotline. I want to speak to God face to face like a friend. And I want to know that when I have sinned, when I have broken God's heart, that I reach out to Him for a change and fear that, he might, that I might not be in His presence anymore. There's a psalm that says, if I regard iniquity in my heart, you won't hear my prayer. You wonder why your prayers aren't getting answered? Maybe it's because you haven't gotten sin out of your heart. And I believe without a doubt, that's what all of us as Christians should be shooting for, striving for, aching for 24-7. That relationship with God face to face. Amen. It reminds me of this character I saw in a movie. And I love that movie because, well, I'm Irish and part Scottish. It's a movie called Braveheart. And if you've seen that movie, you know when they decide to re rebel against the aristocracy, against the government, this, this guy shows up in their camp and, and they, they, he just sneaks in there and they grab him and he, and he looks up and he says, William Wallace. And he just looks up and he says, oh, father, this can't be William Wallace. He's not as handsome as me. And one of the guys that's got a hold of him says, is your father a ghost or do you speak to the Almighty? He said, I speak to the Almighty. This guy, in the middle of anything, would just stop and start talking to God. In the middle of a conversation with people, just look up and say, Father. Oh, I hear you, Father. That's the nutty, crazy, face-to-face -face God relationship I want. Our desire to be close to God ought to be just that overwhelming. It ought to be that all-consuming. It ought to be that nutty, that crazy. Just to have constant contact with God, knowing we're always in His presence. This means that when we become Christians, we've got this new life. And it's a new life that seeks after God and God's will. 
Go to Colossians chapter 3. I'm not going to spend a lot of time in there, but I am going to come back to it. I, I was wanting to go to a particular place, and the Lord led me elsewhere. Go to Colossians chapter 3. This is what God says about that relationship. A little brief understanding of the letter, in case you don't know. Paul wrote that letter because there was some false doctrine and practices that had crept into the church about six years after its founding. Hmm. That can happen at any time. False doctrine had come in the church, so he writes this letter to combat false teaching. But he also, at the same time, wanted to give them encouragement for living the Christian life. And whether you are a new Christian or one that's been a Christian for a long time, this particular passage is one of the greatest passages in all of Scripture. And we can turn to it so we can seek a deeper, more committed walk with the Lord. Colossians chapter 3, the first four verses says this. If ye then be risen with Christ... Seek those things which are above, where Christ sits on the right hand of God. Set your affection on the things above, not on the things of the earth. For you are dead, and your life is hid with Christ. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. Amen. Three quick points. Number one, focus on the positive. Focus on the positive. That's the things above. That is the glory of God. Focus on the positive. See, for new Christians, it ain't that hard, is it? When you become a brand new Christian, man, you are hot for God. You love God. You want to read His Word. You want to tell people about it. But after you've been in it for a while, when you get to be an old bitter Christian, carnal Christian, ridiculous Christian, kind of Christian that you witness stains everybody else's Christian, you have a tendency to focus on the bad things, on the sad things, on the sickness, on the trouble, on the death, on the hurt and the pain and the hurt feelings, and it brings you down. What we need to do is focus like that new Christian. You've got to stay that new. Amen. For the new Christian, it's not that hard because here's what they're doing. They're still thinking and thanking God for salvation. When was the last time you thanked God for your salvation? Today, we did it in prayer, but did you do it this morning when you got up? Did you do it before you went to bed at night? They still look forward to this new and wonderful relationship. The honeymoon is never over with God. They feel the love of the Heavenly Father because they saved someone like them. Anybody can be saved. The Bible is really clear about it. Whosoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. You don't have to live that way. You don't have to live a life wondering what's going to happen. You can accept it. And they get it. They get what this is that they've been missing all of their lives. It is a union with Christ, with the Son of God. Amen? Amen. And what they know, what we know, or should know, is our faith in Him, our faith in Christ, has placed us in Christ. We identify with Christ. This is the power of of the resurrection. I know it ain't Easter yet, but I'm going to talk about the resurrection today. Amen. There is power in the resurrection. When he arose from the dead, we arose with him. The power of his resurrection means a couple of things. It says we've been risen with him. We're not dead anymore. We're risen with Him. We have, in fact, conquered death. Death does not have a hold on us anymore. We are raised to a new life. We don't have to live the old nasty, horrible life. Remember the old broken, slimy, nasty, black heart we needed to replace? The old life in the simple world is over. It's over. It's over. It's got no claim on us. Our old life after salvation has no claim on us. 
We are walking in newness of life. Amen? Amen. We are dead to the sin, but we are alive to God. We are alive to righteousness. We are alive to holiness. Now, I know and I get it. Bad things happen. Horrible things happen. That's what life is. But our focus needs to be redirected toward the things above. Which means more, if not all, of our attention is to be on the ascended and glorified Christ, seated at the right hand of the Father. Colossians 2 and 13 says this, And you... You, remember, I always tell you, read the Bible if God's speaking to you right here, right now. And you, being dead in your sin, dead in your sin, dead in your sin, and uncircumcision of the flesh, hath he quickened. That word quickened means made alive. I'm alive. Together with him, having forgiveness, forgiven you all your trespasses. So there's some great news this morning. Great, awesome, super news. We've all become brothers and sisters with Jesus. <laughs> all our sin's gone. It's washed away. It don't matter no more. The trouble in this world doesn't have any hold on us. I know it's out there. I know it's bad. But you know what? It ain't got no grip on me. Right. How about you? Amen? Amen. <clears throat> all glory be to God. Hallelujah. Second point, focus on the eternal, not the temporal. Focus on the eternal, not, 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 not the temporal. Temporally, I need a little bit of this. <laughs> focus on the eternal. 2 Corinthians 4.18 tells us this. While we look not at the things which are seen, but the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporal, temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Eternal. Now that's not to say, and I, and I want to be really clear here, this is not about drudgery, it's not about denying ourselves, it's not about scourging ourselves, or wearing a hair shirt, or starving ourselves. If you need to fast and pray, please fast and pray, but that's not what it's about. God, uh, the, we don't deny the physical things in our life that are, that are going on while on this earth. We're meant to enjoy life. Even though there's trouble, we're meant to enjoy life. We ought to be seeing in that trouble where God's being glorified. It's just that we should be enjoying life by a power that is beyond this world. That word in, in the passage there, affection. Set your affection on the things above. That, that means to direct your attention and thought to something. Set your affection, your attention and your thought and in this case, it's the heavenly things, not the earthly things. Put very simply, uh, the Christian's mind and life are consumed with Christ in heaven. Consumed with it. And the things uh, that are connected with being risen with Christ. In other words, the results from the power of the resurrection. Here's what the resurrection does for us. And we know it to be true. The resurrection guarantees Christ is the Son of God. And how glorious it is that He sent His Son into the world to save the world. The resurrection of Christ saves and justifies us. That means we're heaven bound. And while we're heaven bound, we're justified, we're cleared of all sin. <clears throat> Salvation and justification should consume our thoughts constantly and we should have praise all day long. So a question has to be asked, are we praising Him all day or are we grumbling and complaining about temporal garbage? The resurrection in Christ gives us power Listen closely to this one. You might think you're helpless. You're not. I'm not. We're not. 
The resurrection gives us power to live in a certain way, and that way is victoriously. Amen. Over sin, over trouble, and, 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 and in the troubles of this world. And we bear the fruit of God's Spirit as we walk through this world. We have victory in Jesus. We have victory over these troubles. I can do all things through Christ who strengtheneth me. I don't have to suffer while I'm in it. Question, are, are we bearing the fruit of God's Spirit? Or are we bearing that old rotten fruit that came before salvation? The resurrection of Christ gives us living hope. Living hope. Living hope. Living hope. I did a funeral last week. And one of the greatest things I could tell people was that this man is in heaven. He's in heaven. If you don't know him, you're not going to be near as happy as him. He has hope. But while we're alive, we have that living hope. Our minds and our praise and our affection needs to focus on the glory of heaven that shall be ours one day when God either takes us home or Christ returns. As Revelation 22, 20 says this, even so, Lord, come. There's this old hymn. I love to sing it. A lot of people love to sing it and put it on gospel albums. I think Alan Jackson's probably done it. I heard a lot of people do it. It's when we all get to heaven. The lyrics are, the, the chorus that says, when we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all see Jesus, we'll sing and shout the victory. Amen. Amen. But here's a fact. We don't have to wait till we get to heaven. We can and we should sing and shout victory now. Because we know the truth of God's great, mighty love for us. Amen? Amen. Amen? Amen. Number three, last point. Focus on the safety in Christ. Focus on the safety in Christ. Man, I got to tell you, there are days and weeks and months and moments in my own life where I have this weird unfounded fear of something I call the what ifs. What if? What about that? I remember when that did that, and, and I'm pretty sure that's going to happen again. Don't want to deal with that. That is the what ifs. It's the unknown. God's word assures me, assures us, there's no fear needed from the things and the troubles of this life. No trials, no problems of this world. I didn't put it up there, but you ought to highlight 2 Timothy 1, verse 7. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Amen. Amen. What a great present. Yeah. No fear from this world. That word hid in the passage, for you are hid Your life is hid with Christ in God. Hid means, actually translated out, means to keep safe. Not hiding in a closet, being afraid of the monster that's coming. I know it's Halloween. <coughs> Michael Myers is not coming to your house. I promise. <coughs> not hid is in fear, but you are hid. Your life is hid with Christ in God. It means to keep safe, to become unknown. By virtue of concealment, secrecy, or complexity, to be protected. This means that God sees uh, the Christian hid in Christ every day. He sees us walking in Christ and Christ's righteousness, not our own. The prophet Isaiah said in 64 6, all our righteousness are as Filthy rags. Man, one day if you want to ask me, I'll tell you what that translates to, and I won't say it in mixed company. All our righteousness, my own, what I think is really good and really cool is filthy rags. Get it from context if you have to. 
We are covered and protected by the blood of our Savior. He wraps himself around us. This is a horrible illustration, but it's the best I have. Here's you. You're this. Okay? Here's Christ. You can't see that anymore. That's protected. Whatever, whatever's going to get to that has got to go through that first. And it's not going to get through that because that's Christ. We're hid in Christ. He wraps himself around us. He's covered us. He's covered us. He's covered our broken sinfulness. He's, he's covered our sins. We're not seen anymore. And because of that, Christ is the only life that God sees living. Christ is our life in the eyes of God. And so one day, we will appear with Christ in glory. Amen. Let me wrap this up. In practical, regular, day-to-day -day living. We have to take the focus off the temporal. Put down, put down, put down the electronic devices. Turn off the television. Get off of the computer. Put down that book that has nothing to do with God. Put that magazine away. Stop doing that, whatever it is where you just twiddle your thumbs. Put it down and look to God. Pick up and read the Word of God. Pick it up and read it. And don't just read it. Pray through it. When you see something there that you need to pray through, you need to pray through it. It's like that passage I shared with you. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. I pray through that. God, help me do that. I want to do that. I want to work out my own salvation. Pray through it. And then apply it. Don't just read it and look at it. Well, that sounds good. That's great. I like that. Apply it. You ain't, listen, you don't have that long of a life. Why not give that a try? I'm just saying, why not give God's word a try? Why not apply that to your life instead of what you think? And the most important thing is get on our knees. Or stand on our feet. Or fall on our faces and praise him, praise him, praise him. Draw close to him with all-consuming joy and set your affection on the things above. And when we do that, then maybe, just maybe, we can have that face-to-face, -face, personal relationship, friend of God, person after God's own heart, crazy close relationship to where we're just having a conversation with somebody and we just stop and say, you know, Father, when you're driving down the road, just start talking to him. When you're at home alone, just start talking to him. When you're about to pick up that device and start scrolling through that garbage, lay it down and start talking to him. That's the relationship we want. Amen? Amen. Amen. Now, before I invite you up, Dan, I'll give you an hour and a half. Amen. I, I finished early. I want to ask you all this morning. I know some of you have, and I think that's great. God bless you, sweetheart. If some of you in this room have never given your life to Christ, if you haven't accepted him, listen, I, and i got to explain this. Real, I, I heard this this week, and it was really hard to hear, but, you know, some people go to church. That's their culture. That's what they do. Their grandparents went to church. Their parents went to church. They go to church. They sing. They worship. They got this worship face on. It's part of their thing. It's part of their culture. But they don't know him. I've said this again and again and again. You can know him or you can know him. And if you don't know him, if you've never understood how much you need him to repent and ask Jesus to be the Lord of your life, that's what Peter said. Repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. 
Paul put it this way, whosoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. If you've never done that, I'm going to ask you to come up today and get saved. <clears throat> don't be nervous about it. Don't be scared about it. I don't deal with that well. Because if, if you don't tell me, I don't know. And you need to be telling everybody you got saved. That's right, amen. You need to be telling everybody you got saved. Yeah. Woohoo! <laughs> Man, isn't it great to be saved? Amen. So I'm going to ask you to come forward if you haven't done that. And um, you want to play the last song after that? Or do it now? Why don't you come on up and, and let's end this part and we'll turn it over to Dan. As we sing about God's amazing grace, remember the altar is open up here. If you Amen. need to pray to receive Christ, or if you need to pray for any power to live like what our brother's talking about, the scripture says, do that now. Amen. Amazing grace.
And so what I'm going to ask you to do right now is just stand where you are, bow your heads, put your hand forward toward Jacob, and we're going to pray for him and his mom this morning. Gracious Heavenly Father, God, we love you so much. Father, we love you for the salvation that you bring, but God, we also love you for the healing that you bring in our lives, Father God. Things happen, and they're not always great, but we trust you, Lord, for your will and for your sovereignty and for your grace and for your mercy. And we beg you now, Father, for peace in Jacob's life and in his mom's life and all of his family members that are dealing with our health issues. God, lift them up and give them peace in your name. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. All right, Dan, come on up. I'm just going to take this off and pin it on you. Do I need that? I don't know. You're kind of loud. <laughs> I had a guy tell me last week in the church where we're in from pastor, he told me as we walked out, he says, you have the voice of a pastor. You don't need a microphone. <laughs> you can put that wherever you want. All right. Praise the Lord. Amen. Well, how do I follow that message? But praise the Lord for what he's done for us and what he's done for you. If you know him as your personal Lord and Savior, let me encourage you through 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 17 tells us what? When we receive Christ, old things pass away. And what? And all things become new. And never forget that. I just want to ditto what Pastor said and encourage you with those words. Great message, Pastor. Praise the Lord for that. But no one can take the joy of our salvation away unless we allow it. Amen. We always can celebrate in our salvation. As we want to come to update you in 2019, which is this current year, uh, July 23rd, or 24th, excuse me, we departed to Ghana, West Africa, which many of you are aware of, uh, where we serve there um, doing vacation Bible school and youth ministries. Praise the Lord for our team. It was very, very small this year. It was myself, my wife, and my daughter, Catherine. But uh, one of the local pastors that we worked alongside there just sent out an update. Uh, just Actually, I just read it when we arrived at the hotel here. And we had touched over 5,000 lives with the Word of God. Amen. With the Word of God, 5,000 individuals, children and youth, heard the preaching and teaching in the Word of God. 230 were recorded and responding in the time that we were there. Now, that's wonderful news. As we had time to minister, I just we just took some quick pictures. Uh, Pastor gave me an hour and a half, so we put together about a three-minute video, and then I'll share with you in Word the remainder time. So uh, I think everybody has crockpots on warm, right? Yeah. Or low. It's on low. So as long as it's not on high, we're good, right? <laughs> so as we as we take a look, like I said, we did vacation Bible school. In four weeks, some of you may not know our ministry exactly what we do. As you know, um, previous Pastor Todd Boston that was here. Uh, his daughter participated with us, and during that, a lot of a lot that were here at that time learned what we did. What we did, but we go to Ghana, and we do three day vacation Bible school. Why only three days? Even though our vacation Bible school here in America is set up for how many days? Five. Well, you'll see in the picture when we do five day, we did one five day program. And I will promise you, as long as God calls me to Ghana, West Africa, to do vacation Bible school, I will never do a five-day program again. <laughs> All right? It is, it, it's, it'll blow your mind with the children that show up. You cannot control them. You cannot rouse them in an area. You can't have a microphone loud enough. In three days, in two of the largest ministries that we've done, in three days, we had over 700 children. That's 700 children... Organized and put together by maybe 16, 18, 25 adults if you're lucky. And now you try to teach 700 children with 25 adults trying to keep them all together. It gets tough. So that's why we do three days is to control the size. Um, normally in that we see anywhere between 250 and 500 children. And we praise the Lord for that. It fluctuates between ministry to ministry. So we just had, in the four weeks we were there, we did eight churches. Now, if you do the math, and you do, we landed July 24th in Ghana, West Africa. We departed April or August 23rd. If you're quick and you're grabbing a calendar, what happened the very day we hit the ground in Ghana, West Africa? We were involved in ministry. And no rest, no breaks, 
if that's the way we want it. We're sent there to do the work of the Lord, and we're not there sent to do vacation. We're not there sent to see the country. We're there to see boys and girls learn about Jesus and respond to his salvation message. Amen. So as we, as we began there, it, the trip really began, as Anita just flipped to the slide there, in May. We're shipping these supplies. i got to tell you, what good is this picture? It's a trailer. How many of you know about trailers? i got to raise my hand, and I'm a marine mechanic, so both sit on a trailer, and I'm really, I'm going to be prideful here. I know a lot about trailers, a ton about trailers. I know their capacity. I know their size. I know what they should have on them. I know what they shouldn't have on them. My friend comes to me and we're sitting there. How are we going to get this stuff ready to go to Ghana? We got to get this stuff to Maryland to ship. Oh, dear. We got 7,500 pounds of material. What are we going to do? Anybody see the trailer? Anybody catching what's going on? It doesn't matter how much material we have. Put it on the big tech trailer. And Anita, my wife, and my daughter Catherine will head from Michigan to Maryland and tow that trailer to Maryland, and the stuff will get there. Wow. I'm just going to tell you quickly, I know a lot about trailers. <laughs> I know a lot about the capacity of a 6,500-pound forklift can lift pallets with no problem and can set them on that trailer without issue. Three of them. And those barrels are 7,500 pounds on a 3,500-pound single-axle trailer. Never even dawned on me. I even had the joy of towing it to and from a local church there and hooked it up to my avalanche and sent my wife and daughter across the country. They get to Maryland, and they come back home with that trailer empty. Now, what's the story? My friend that loaned me the trailer come to pick it up. Didn't think it, hooked it up. He looks in his rear view mirror before he leaves my shop. Damn, that tire was straight. When I gave you the trailer, both tires are now like this. <laughs> the story even gets better, and I mean, I'm telling you the exact truth. He gets out and comes and tells me. I'm like, what? Oh, you know the weight? I put on that 3,500 pound big text trailer. Went to, we looked at the inside of the tires. The inside of the tire was shredded from rubbing up against the fender. Now, I want you to know how my wife and my daughter made it to Maryland fully loaded without those tires shredding was only by the grace of God. Amen. And I'm telling you that as, yeah, my stupidity my great knowledge and knowing trailers didn't even dawn on me what I was putting on there. I was focused on get these ministry items to Maryland to get to Africa. And God watches over us and protects us each step of the way when we strive to do his ministry. My stupidity, God just went, I'm going to get that material there for you, Dan. In spite of your stupidity, 7,500 pounds on a 3,500... You put your wife in danger, you put your daughter in danger, and those tires should have shredded alongside the road. But praise the Lord for that. So I just want to give glory to God for that. Those are the items there that you see that arrived in Ghana. Um, that's what we hit the ground to when we arrived in Ghana. And we have to sort all those. We have to sort those into ministries. Those of you that know uh, Gospel Literature Services or Regular Baptist Press, they donate all of the previous year's Vacation Bible School materials to us. Praise the Lord. We just last week received eight more pallets. Guess how much they weigh? <laughs> <laughs> Little over $8,000 or 8,000 pounds on the bill of lady that I received. I promise you I won't stack all those on a big tent. I got a car hauler now that, that's rated at about 8,000 pounds. So we'll max that out with 15,000 pounds of material and get it gone. <laughs> So, but as we arrive, we have those, we sort that out, um, we hit the ground running there, beginning to sort the materials. This is just a simple uh, teaching time that we had as we met Saturday, uh, teaching all the individuals of the material that we'll use. These are some of the pastors and a lot of the leaders that came along our side to participate. That's just a photo in a teaching session that we had and, and getting them familiar with the material that we're going to use for those three days. 
This is uh, just pictures of the ministries that we see, the very first ministry, the 29th through the 31st. Um, there you see in attendance with three of us, and we had four leaders of the local church. Day one was 120, day two, 159, and day three, 242. These are registered numbers. How many of you have served in a foreign ministry before? You know, here in America, registration, all of us understand. Kids, get in this line, come, register, right? They all get in that line, everything else. In Ghana, they go right on past the registration table. These are the ones that we know were registered. Um, when it comes time that we participate in um, gifts as they leave, we think, oh, we're good. We got 250 bags of candy or whatever we're going to give out as they leave. We're good. We got 250. We're planned. You got any more candy in either of that line? It's the same length as what it was when it started. We're out. What do we do? God has always been faithful. We've always, we've always been able to meet. Every, each and every child that has left Vacation Bible School has always left with a gift uh, to remind them of what they have learned and to remind them of God's, God's goodness to us. So La Baptist was our first ministry. Second ministry, we went on to the central region. There in Mumford, uh, you'll see the attendance there. Uh, doubled the second day. We were in trouble. One of the most wonderful things that you'll see in the next video as you review, review those numbers quickly, down in the left hand, those are chairs. We had to go rent chairs. The church is packed out like this here, and we have no place for the kids to sit. What do we do? We're going to go rent chairs, and they go out in the community, find schools that have chairs, and we rent them. And these are the kids that are in vacation Bible school carrying those chairs. So go ahead to the next slide. I think it shows it a little bit better. We have a parade. The leaders come. As we come to this ministry in Mumford, we come there, and it's supposed to start at 3 o'clock. We're there at 2.30, and we're looking. And I always have the mindset of when we do ministry, if there's one, that one is who God has sent. Yep. And that is great. We're going to teach one, or we're going to teach 500. It doesn't matter. We're going to teach one. Well, when we arrived, we had probably about 30 children there. Mumford's known to be a larger ministry for us. And my philosophy of ministry, Satan began to work it against me. I'm looking and I'm like, Lord, there's only 30. Wish this is one of the larger ministries. What's happening here in Mumford? Kind of began to get discouraged. And I'm just telling you the truth from my heart, which I hope I can do. And Satan began to take and rob the joy of vacation Bible school from me because I'm like, Lord, one, why am I discouraged? One that you sent should be enough. There's 30. And I'm still feeling my heartache going, there should be more. And I'm sitting there, and I go and I sit in one of those chairs, and I just bow my head and I begin to pray. And as I pray, I'll tell you, I'm a crybaby. <laughs> Tears come to my eyes, and I just say, Lord, forgive me, because one's enough. In 30, you've given. And then I hear a parade, and it's going to move me now. I hear the song. O vacation, O vacation, O vacation Bible school. We will love it. You will love it. O vacation Bible school. I hear the song. And I'm going, that's a parade. We don't have all the kids here because they went in the community to walk around that village with that banner. And here comes over 100 to 150 kids. I don't know exactly how many are in that line. But here they come screaming and singing that song as loud as they could. Amen. Who was I to sit there and allow Satan to discourage me in a time of ministry over 1 or 30 and then yet they're out bringing more. So don't allow Satan to get you to focus on the wrong things. That's where my heart was. I was on the wrong, I was focused on the wrong things. And God revealed himself very, very quickly. There they are getting in line because this one was successful. They came in a line, so we were able to go, stay in the line right here to registration, please. So you'll see there. Old vacation Bible school. <laughs> Okay, they go through that, and that was taken from a cell video, a cell phone video. But imagine all of them in that line singing in rhythm, led by Pastor Isaac, who's the pastor of this local church that we ministered in. 
And I mean, they, it's, it'll bring chill to your bones if you're ever there and you hear them sing that song. They get tired. This is probably a three-year-old uh, little boy. Um, came on the back of either his sister, his sister or, or uh, his, his sister or his brother. And they come to do it. They come to participate in vacation Bible school. But we have to set an age limit, just like we do here. And we set an age limit of five. Well, he's three. What do we do? We don't have a class for them or anything like that. So what do we do? Well, if we say the three-year-old can't come, then we lose the eight or nine-year-old that the younger brother or sister is strapped to the back of because they have to go home. So we just do our best and we just ask them that they need to care for their little brother or sister, but they can stay. Well, they do care because when they get tired, they just go set them in a corner on the concrete and let them go to sleep. So that's just why we take that as, as no mats, no nothing, just... Go to sleep there in the corner, and they do. They just we have we have many that we find like that all the time. The worst of it is we find them when vacation Bible school is over. <laughs> who's who's? And it's absolutely amazing. But then we moved on to the Apom ministry. There you'll see uh, 195 on day one, jump into 393 on day two, and day three. This is a church that we had to split our ministry. We had to split it in the morning, in the evening, because we exceeded the fire code. Uh, there's no such thing in Ghana, but the fire code is when no more will fit. You're full. And we were full and we were maxed out. I think the next picture shows a um, actual. There is about 65 children in that small little room. And they are happy as happy can be. Now, are you ready? I think some of you that know our ministry that have participated with us before in the past and seen our our. Um, Updates and what we share, they will sit like that for two to three hours wow. and not move. Wow. All for the learning and preaching, teaching of God's word. Now rest assured, we don't leave them sitting like that for two to three hours. They're in there for no more than 30 minutes. Um, this is just a classroom. This is one of our African leaders here. His name is Jacob here in the front teaching God's word. And you'll see the kids and they're attentive. I mean, they're sitting basically on top of each other. And they're just listening to the Word of God. So praise the Lord for that. Amen. Game time. This is game time um, with one of the groups, uh, one of the age groups that we just take out. It's uh, along the line of Awana games that we use, a circle and different games that happen around that circle in different teams. Um, you haven't seen competition until you've seen Ghanaians compete in games. <laughs> Uh, we moved on from uh, Apam to Ankamu. Very interesting. This was the first time, or second time ministry in Ankamu, but this was our first time being challenged by local leaders in the community. We come and we've never been challenged by local leaders here, and they caught wind of day one, wanted to know what all the activity was going on at the school, why, what was going on, why were all these kids flocking to the school, and they came and they challenged the local pastor that, he couldn't have vacation Bible school at this school because it was in violation of their rules, so on and so forth. So the pastor goes, no, I asked permission. The headmaster said we could have it here. And so we continued. We went on to day two, and four men came to the corner of the school, and the local pastor went over there. His name is Richard, and asked if he could help them. They said, yes, we're here to take the kids away. And he just says, no, you're not taking the kids away. They're all here. They've come voluntarily. Well, we're going to stop them from coming. Now, this is not the law. This is nothing as far as any government officials. This is some individuals within the community that didn't like what we were doing because of the attraction that the kids had to come. They were trying things in their ministries, and for whatever reason, they couldn't get the attraction for the children to come. They would come and get 30. They wouldn't get the kids in the numbers that God brought to us. But on the third day, you'll see their 134 a.m. class. Why? The local pastor, Richard, was very, very wise because these four men organized a, a class or something that our third day. They said, we can't stop them from coming. These kids, we try to do something, and they still run to this vacation Bible school. So we're going to organize something in the community this third day, the same time that they have vacation Bible school. 
the local pastor caught wind of the organization, and he just comes and he goes, Pastor Dan, can we do vacation Bible school tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock? We normally do it at 3. I'm like, Pastor Richard, we'll do it whenever you want it. You tell me. I said, sure. He goes, let me tell you why. Because these four men had organized a group um, get-together to pull the kids away from us. So he says, no, no. We're going to let them do what they want to do. We'll just move our times. We, we made the announcements to the kids. And that third day, God brought us still 134, even with the children being threatened not to come and everything else. That was our first challenge that we've ever had in ministry as far as kids being threatened not to come. And so, but we praise the Lord for what he did for us. This one, I'll, I'll get through it. This is a man named Frank. 2009, he was in Vacation Bible School there at one of the ministries you've seen in the Palm. He sat there as an older, um, he wasn't youth at that point in time, but he was the oldest in the youngest, uh, youngest children's class. Let me put it that way. And he sat there and he thought about it. He thought about uh, what we had shared, the word of God. He thought about his salvation. Didn't make any decision for Christ. 2011, we returned back to Ghana, and he was there as a youth because he jumped up, and he was in the youth program. There, he responded to the gospel message of Jesus Christ, and he was led to the Lord by one of the local pastors there. I didn't, I didn't know him. I didn't know anything about him his salvation, except in the reports back from the pastors that they shared with me. Well, when we were preparing for this ministry, he came to me and he said, Pastor Dan, I am so thankful. I miss you so much. I'm glad you guys came back. That's great, Frank. Why, why are you so glad we came back? He went to share with me that he accepted Christ in 2011, and he could not wait to be involved in Vacation Bible School to reinvest his time so children would know the salvation message of Jesus Christ. That brought me right there with him. I just simply prayed, and then I asked that they would take that photo just so I could share with you. That is the impact, and he feels that God is calling him on to go on to Bible school and become a pastor. That is that fruit that God blesses all of your lives with, all of ours, because we are partners in ministry. This isn't anything that Dan has done. This is what God has done right. by you enabling us to go and share the gospel message of Jesus Christ. What will be the impact if Frank follows through on the call that God has placed on his life and he becomes a pastor and he goes in a village and continues to share the gospel message of Jesus Christ? All of that will go to your account, to our account, in glory. Amen. All of it. And that's the fruit that God lets us see. Just little tidbits here and there. Of the 230 this year, I have no idea who's God, who God is going to call on to ministry. But God is faithful and he, and he works in individuals' hearts. Another new ministry there at Bethel Baptist Church there. Uh, a smaller ministry. Um, it was here that the bus didn't show up. It broke down. Uh, no, no, wrong ministry. Sorry, I got my ministries confused. This is a new ministry to us in a smaller village. Um, you can't see it, but on the to the left of it is a mega church. Right there, that small brick wall that you see, that cement wall. To the left of it is a mega church that probably seats over 3,500 people. And they are there as a big attraction to the kids. Like I said, this ministry, God really let us see that we're in a war. Yeah. We're in a struggle. These kids have other attractions. They have other opportunities to go rather than come to vacation Bible school. But we're so thankful that God continues to bring them. There's Catherine and teaching of the smaller kids, um, the word of God and the message that, uh, that we had during vacation Bible school. There I am. Anybody notice what's in the hand? Huh? Yeah, crayons. We, uh, those are crayons that all of you Participated in. Do you remember that crayon drive we had about five years ago, I believe? Mm -hmm. When we got to Ghana, we still had more crayons that we hadn't had the opportunity to give out. We didn't give out all of them last time we were there. We had these. So all of our crayons are now gone. <laughs> and praise the Lord for that. So as, uh, as God gives us opportunity, we'll be getting word out for that. But they look at those crayons. I can't tell you how they, 
I mean, how we look at crayons are, it's not sharp anymore. We throw them out. We do whatever. You get to the doctor's office, the ends of them are rolled over, whatever else, throw them out, do whatever. These kids, I think I've shared many of, with many of you before, they will break them in half when we go to collect our color crayons back from the arts and crafts that they did and stuff. They will break them in half, put half in their pocket, and turn in half. Now, I'll tell you, me as, I'm like, what's the big deal? Who cares? It's one crayon. But I'll tell you, the local pastors, that's stealing. Mm. Really, yeah. it is. Yeah. It is. And, and I share that with you from the perspective of how they value these small things. But the local pastors make sure that they understand and they know what they're doing is stealing. I mean, when the local pastor sees that they've turned in a half a crayon, because they'll get our reaction. Look at, okay, don't say anything. Just keep on going. Else. They'll be like, what? Oh, nothing, Pastor. Where's the other half of the crayon? Who has this? And no, uh, well, who had this color? And of course, one little boy will, over there, you know, over there, they don't have the rules and laws we do. The pastor goes, all right, starts grabbing the pocket, takes a switch, bang. You don't steal from these people. All for a half a crayon. So he could take it home and color or do whatever else. Now I know we think, oh, how mean, how cruel. But really, they stole when we asked for that. I mean, this isn't us doing this. I'm just sharing this with you on the value that they put on those crayons and the things that we're able to minister to them, and they never forget. Uh, Grace Baptist Church, this was the church that the van broke down on the way on the first day. Uh, 52, we got started, supposed to start, start at 9 o'clock, we got started at 11.30, um, it was quite a challenge that day, but God saw us through with 52, second and third day the van arrived, and praise the Lord for that, um, that was a new ministry for us, um, and we look forward to going back there this next year um, as we minister again. Um, set Time Baptist Church, <laughs> this is a growing ministry, that's all I got to say. How many of you remember me telling you the story that five children showed up the first day? This was uh, two years ago. Five children showed up the first day, and I challenged those five kids that if they would go out within the local village, I would give them what? A box of crayons, but they had to bring at least five kids, five of their friends back with them. So that means the first day, five went out. If they all brought five, five times five, quick, fast, easy, 25, right? Yeah. No, the first day we had over 100 all from offering five kids a box of crayons that they'll go bring their friends. And this is that ministry. And day one, we walked in there, and I had kids coming up and running to me, to Anita, to Catherine. Pastor Dan, Pastor Dan. What? Oh, we were here two years ago when you were here. You remembered who I was. And this is just the impact. Why do I share that? The impact that you are able to make there in Africa as we go and share the word of God with these children. They remember. They remember what we have to share. Most important, the gospel message of Jesus Christ. This is another ministry that started off from us in you, and they started a children's ministry from Vacation Bible School. Just a quick picture there of some arts and crafts just kind of showing you. Uh, how we get involved with them. We get right down to the nitty-gritty, right down, and we color with them, and we do crafts with them, just like we're going to do with you in a moment. <coughs> just another photo there of Catherine, just fitting right in. You know, One of the things I'll share with you that's close to Catherine and Anita's heart that they would share if they were talking is we get time and time again of the local pastors that come to us and say, your ministry is so much different than others that come. Others that come take the small children, the children that want to come up and touch their arms and wipe their skin, and they look at me, and they come up, and they're pulling on the hair on my arm, and, like, oh, and they just pull and drag, and it's wonderful. I really, really mean that. And I'll get right down with them, and they'll, they're nasty old hands all over me. Same thing with Anita, same thing with Catherine. They will just, just want to touch you. And a lot of people won't get down and let these kids touch them. Stay away. Now, there are health challenges. Don't get me wrong. I do understand their concerns. 
but the ministry there of the local pastors are, you guys are one of the few that come and get involved and will take with the craft we're going to do with you. You're going to understand what I mean this. Someone that can't get the leather through the bead. And we go and we want to help them. And you grab the leather. Oh, it's been in her mouth. Hey, <laughs> Benachua. Grab it and put it through. But praise the Lord for hand sanitizer. <laughs> That's why he created it. That's why God gave us hand sanitizer. So we can get down in the nitty gritty with these kids and show them the love of Christ. And then when we're done, we're worried about the germs that may be on our hand. Take a little hand sanitizer. We're good to go for the next ministry. We're good. And that's exactly what we do. Uh, that's Set Time Baptist Church Thursday, packed wall to wall. If you look up in the back where the um, podium is, you can't, but behind the, behind the fat white guy there, he's be, behind that are a lot of the smaller children up by the pulpit. That place was packed wall to wall. Um, we couldn't fit. We could barely fit anymore. They were in walking areas everywhere else, but... Let them come. Praise the God. Praise God for that. Our final ministry was at Crossroads Baptist Church, um, and there, just the numbers there show for themselves. That is a schoolroom, and those benches are designed for two students. <laughs> two students is what should be sitting on those benches. If you get close to the video or close to the picture, you'll see there's four or five packed on those benches. Yeah. And the only thing I remember is as we were there, because we didn't have any more benches, we couldn't go get any more chairs, there was no more room in the room, in the uh, room we were in, all the leaders kept saying to these kids, scooch, scooch, scooch. And I'm like, they can't scooch anymore. They're already, no, scooch, we can get this much more and a kid can sit there. It's the truth. It's the honest truth. And they come and they just, they just sit and they just listen to God's word. It's absolutely amazing. I think that is, this is treasure box. This is just what we award certain kids on uh, during our message time and answer questions um, in regards to paying attention during our lesson time and during game time. Uh, we give out gold coins. They bring those gold coins back to us and they get to choose from that treasure box. This is the local uh, pastors there. Every ministry we have, we turn the... Um, the uh, salvation time over to the local pastors. Even though they speak English, they don't speak our English. They understand our English, but I have to slow down and talk very, very slowly for them to understand me. So during the um, um, salvation time, as we put the call to them and as God works in their heart, I step aside and turn the invitation time over to the local pastor. Because he can talk to them. Their language. There's no misunderstanding. They know they're not coming up and responding for a piece of toffee from the white guy. They know they're responding to the message of Jesus Christ. Because a lot of them see me and they automatically think, unfortunately the thought is there. He's white. He has money. He's going to give me something. And we learn that very, very quickly. So at the invitation time, I step aside and I turn it over to the local pastors so there can be no misunderstanding. And these are individuals that are responding and taking it aside. We just want to thank you for partnering with us. And in saying thank you, a small gift that God has just laid on my heart, London and Katie are going to pass out these little bags to you. These are the, some of the ministry things that we do as a craft and as uh, use it in the children's lives. And it's hit us. We did this as we um, shared our ministry with another local church, and it hit us. What's the use of this little thing? How silly. And God's like, how silly. You don't know how many kids in Africa come back and tell us on these little crafts that we're going to do here, it's going to take literally five minutes, on these crafts, this necklace, and how it has helped them let others know, number one, they're a believer in Jesus Christ. And number two, let's them share the gospel message of Jesus Christ with everybody that's asked them. Why are you wearing that necklace? What does that mean? Tell me. And they're proud to tell them. They want them to know what that necklace means. 
So as we shared that with a previous ministry, we want to share it with you. And do we have enough? Got an extra one back there? Nana, go get that extra one, please. There's always the risk. Kate, if you want to go, I'll finish passing those out if you want to. Who doesn't have one? Raise your hand. Let's see. we got a few more. We're going to make it. Look, you got a whole handful. Praise the Lord. I'm going to turn it over to Catherine. This is one thing that Catherine does is just we go through and we just make this craft real quick. Like I said, it's about three or four minutes. We're not going to have to come and help you. You're going to be able to do it all yourself. And uh, if you do need help, Anita's coming. And just, you know, go ahead and chew on it. Make it all slimy. And we're, going to, we're going to lunch here in just a minute. And make it all slimy and everything. So uh, I'll turn it over to Catherine and let her explain this to you. And I wonder what impact. I'm just going to challenge. How silly. What a silly challenge, Pastor. But I wonder what impact it would be if you hung that around your neck for a day. Yeah. And you wore that around Port Clinton. And somebody, when you were at McDonald's getting that coffee, why you got that silly necklace on? That looks like a kid's craft or something. What does that mean? What would your response be? What would you tell them? When you see what the craft turns out to be, it might help you something. And I'm going to just make a joke real quick. It will match anything you wear. You know, my daughters are my... Um, my, my uh, what do you call it? My stylist or my fashion designers. And I don't listen to them. See, today I got blue pants on and I got black socks and black shoes. Is there anything wrong with that, ladies? No. no. Teenagers, am I good? Sure. Huh? Yeah. Now this morning, daughters, they're telling me I'm okay. Why I'm telling you this? Because this, this craft you're going to make, tell you what it is when we're done, matches anything you wear. It has five colors in it. And those five colors will at least match something you have on, so you have no excuse not to wear it because it won't match your outfit. <laughs> Catherine, go ahead. So we make this salvation necklace. It's just like the salvation bracelet, but it has a bigger impact on the kids because it turns into a shape of something. Okay, so everybody take out your black bead. Okay, as I tell the children, the black bead stands for our sin. We're all sinners, and all kids they all agree with me. They go, yes, yes, with the sin, and I explain it to them. And so what they do is they put the black bead on their string, just like this. If it won't go through, go ahead and lick it. <laughs> Stick it through there. <laughs> It'll go through the bead. Okay, everybody has their black bead on, correct? <laughs> the next color we will take out is the color red. When you take out your red bead, you will be putting on it both ends through the string. Both, both ends, ends through, through the bead. bead. And you're going to just tie it on there really tight, just like this. Both ends through the string. Okay, as I tell the kids, red stands for Jesus' <coughs> blood. God loved us so much that he didn't want us in our sin, and he sent Jesus to die on a cross for us. Does everybody have their red bead on? Anybody need help? Now on the other side 
side that you haven't put the other beads, you're going to take the yellow bead. Yellow. Oh, what a blessing. Yellow is heaven. Why do we say yellow? Because he says it's in the Bible he has made the streets gold. And we get to be up there. And what I explain to my children is gold is very expensive, yes? Oh, it's very precious, yes? To God, it's dirt. Why? Because he paved the streets with it. What are paved outside? Cement, dirt. God, we are more precious to God than gold. We are so precious that he sent us son. He didn't want us to be separate from him. So our yellow bead goes on, and now our last bead is green. 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 If you've done it right, you got green. And now green reminds us that while we're, the Lord leaves us here, he's going, he wants us to grow. So you're going to take your two strings again, you're going to put them together, and you're going to thread the bead through again on top. Green reminds us to grow. How do we grow as Christians? We read the Bible, we pray, we, we fellowship with other Christians who encourage us. Growing is just, just isn't doing that, it's, it's, it's being fed, it's being nurtured, it's being watered. And we can do that by other Christians encouraging and coming around us. And so we don't forsake the assembling, it's coming together. Amen. Now you're going to take your two beads, your two strings, you're going to tie a knot on top to make sure it's nice and snug so your beads don't slip around. And if you hold it correctly, you're going to have the shape of a cross. Yes. And then, of course, I get, I get the joy of getting coins out. And I always like to tell them, okay, guys, what's the bottom be? Black. What does black remind us of? Sin. Are we all sinners? Yes. There is no one that is just. No, not one. And then I like to say, has the president got a sin? Oh, yes. Has the Pope sinned? Yes. Yes, yes, yes. Have I sinned? Yes. Of course, they say yes a lot faster than they said Pope, but yes, <laughs> I have sinned. And then I go, has the President of the United States sinned? Oh, yes. Yes, yes. Yes. Has Pastor Dan sinned? Yes. 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 We've all sinned. There's no one just. No, not one. And then I like to remind you, black bean is on the bottom because what goes on top of it? The blood. Blood. That's right. It's always at the bottom because the blood is on the top. And then we go on, and I get to test them, and they love it. And then just tie a little knot at the top, slip it over your head. You guys got a nice, fancy, very expensive. You know why it was expensive? Because you made it yourself. <laughs> you can't put a cost on that, can you? And it's a great starter. And they get to wear these out into the village. They love it. Now, if I actually even have a kid who is... Um, maybe on a, a salvation call or who came in late, they will line up behind me and follow me around for two hours until they get a bracelet mm -hmm. or a necklace because they want that necklace. Mm -hmm. And you guys, churches, like your church, help us make these. I will actually have some churches that will have assemblies of, of women that will get together and they'll buy the beads and they'll buy the little bags and they will make me 5,000 of these. And that will get me through one ministry. That will get me through one vacation Bible school. I'll get through one. I ran out at the last, the last ministry we ran out. So I was, I was taking necklaces and cutting them in half to make bracelets because I run out. I thought five thousand surely would be enough, and it didn't. It ended up being enough, not enough. But God is good, and I split it. And I was now you can take the bags home if you want, or you can recycle them, or whatever you guys want to do. But this is something we do. When I'm trying to teach 400 kids to do this necklace and trying them to be quiet, <laughs> those little beads roll. I mean, you know, they're all on the floor. <laughs> okay. It's great. We don't need any hand sanitizer. We did well. well I, I didn't see anybody. I didn't see anybody chewing or anything. You did great. But that is just a quick update uh, from our ministry in 2019. Uh, we are turning and going again in 2020. Back to back, so this will be the first time that we did back to back ministries. Reason being is we ended up skipping 2018 that we were to be there. Just for whatever reason, I don't know, I don't need to know, but we couldn't get everything together. Not just here in the United States. We, I just, it just did not come together for whatever reason. And as I called and shared with Pastor Kennedy and Pastor Josiah, shared with them, and they're like, Pastor, it isn't coming together here either. And I'm like, God, thank you. Praise the Lord. Your message is clear. We're not going. 
And, you know, as God closes a door, we shouldn't be sitting there pounding on it, jamming it, trying to get through it when God closes that door. Right. We simply accept it and say, God, it's what you want. Show me and lead me where you want me to go now. And again, we went 2019 in the ministry the items that we've already received. We are putting the trip together for 2020. Again, we hope it's larger than Anita, myself, and Catherine, but God will assemble his team. And if you would be interested in participating with us and going, uh, please see me. Everybody, let me just share with you quickly. If you remember Bree Boston when she attended First Baptist Church of Oxford, she was one of the very first youth that God laid on my heart to begin to pray for her. I did. I challenged her from God's word to go to Ghana, West Africa. Her very first statement she said to me is, there's no way I can afford it. I was Bree's youth leader at the time. And she says, I can't afford it. And I said, you're right, you can't. Nor can I. But God can. Amen. If he wants you to go, simply pray, and God will send you. Right. You don't send yourself. We don't send ourselves. God sends us. Right. So don't be, don't look at, oh, so much money for, I just can't. It's not you. It's God. Amen. If God has planned for you to go, he will provide every step of the way. So we challenge you to that. If you're interested, if God lays it on your heart, see us. You're not making a commitment to us that we're going. Just simply let us pray for you. And if God if God blooms that interest and you participate with us, we praise him. If you don't, we praise him because we've had opportunity to pray for you. And again, along for the ministry. Wear that necklace just one day. See if anybody asks you a question about it. If they do, tell them what it's all about and see what God does.